In the early 20th century, children with developmental disabilities had no advocates. Their parents were encouraged to institutionalize them where they were hidden away from society and forgotten. That changed in 1950 when Roy and Georgette Engler founded Sunshine Children's Home, where they treated their patients with an innovative new therapy, heavy doses of love and compassion. Over the years, Sunshine expanded its services to meet the growing needs of the community through a unique partnership with the Mennonite Church. And their history chronicles the changing way our nation has treated people with disabilities. The mission of Sunshine is to create community among people with developmental disabilities and their families and friends and staff by providing an array of services that helps all of us to grow in mutual love and caring for one another. We do this under the, the vision of Roy and Georgette Engler. They are our founders. They wanted to bring a little sunshine into the lives of, of children with disabilities. Making Sunshine is made possible by KeyBank, National Association Trustee of the Walter E. Terhune Memorial Fund, Metzger's Printing and Mailing, Brookside Contracting, and Fliegers Pro Hardware. Also supported by Mennonite Foundation and Everance Financial, formerly MMA, offering financial and charitable giving services from a faith perspective. Making Sunshine is also made possible by the generous donations from the following families, individuals, and organizations, and from viewers like you. Thank you. In 1917, Northwest Ohio was one of the busiest railroad centers in the nation. Roy Engler worked as a railroad telegrapher in Maumee, a short distance from the Casabon family store. Uh, he used to go into the country store, met Georgette there working and assisting her mother and father in the operating of the business. And they met and obviously fell in love and, and from that point on they married and had their children. Their first child was stillborn, followed by twin girls, Geraldine and Imogene, and then three boys, Roy Jr., Donald, and Richard. But their lives were destined for hardship. As I understand it, all five of your children are mentally retarded. We had twin daughters. A while after, we had three boys. And one passed away at eight years old. We did not find until after they were in school that they were mentally retarded. Their five children were born with, with disabilities due to the RH negative factor. They were born to them in the 1920s when we knew absolutely nothing about the RH negative factor. Georgette Angler's blood type was RH negative and essentially incompatible with that of her husband and unborn children. As the twin girls, of course, went to school, they were uh, picked on by kids because they were slow and the Englers began to recognize there was a problem. It was at a time in our history when there was not much community acceptance of folks with disabilities. There was a lot of shame associated with it, etc. And the Anglers uh, experienced all of that as they raised these uh, five children at, at home. Mrs. Engler's mother, Georgina Casabon, gave George at seven acres of land she decided that the family should move and that they would be out in the country away from the city and the environment of day-to-day of -day bullying by other children. Roy was working two jobs at, uh, in a calendar day the most of his adult life and become licensed to practice electrical work as well as being a trained telegrapher. So he contracted out and would do a lot of work on the side uh, to earn extra money to keep food on the table and then Georgette would stay home with the children. So f pretty much the majority of every day, Roy was gone from the household. The pressure to look after their handicapped children was great. And she was at home all day long, every day. Georgette at times threatened to commit suicide that the burden was so great. 
The Englers considered institutionalizing their children and even visited the Columbus State School for feeble-minded children. But they were appalled at the living conditions and realized they could provide a much better home. The institutions that were run primarily were run by the state and they were in terrible condition and they felt that they had to open up a home because they knew that their children would not be cared for and there were many babies being born in our greater Toledo area with Down syndrome and that they needed to find a home for them. So they opened up their their home and they built the first Sunshine Children's Home. Before long, Roy Engler recruited area contractors and businesses to donate labor and materials for a very simple cement block building so they could care for a growing number of children. Roy Engler would go out and, and ask people to give, uh, coerce people to give. Yeah, he was a good salesman. He was. My dad liked him. I mean, everybody that I know liked him. Anything that, that Mr. Engler had asked for, my dad would do because he liked him and liked the cause. and Sure, we'll make that for you. Sure, we'll do that. When they started Sunshine Children's Home in 1950, they just wanted it to be a very loving, caring, clean home. One of their key purposes was to have a place where parents could bring their children if they felt they could no longer care for them at home and feel good about it and know that there was folks at Sunshine caring for their sons and daughters, offering the same kind of love as they as parents were doing at home. I love that lady. She was wonderful. She hired me and she trained me. She had a lot of rules. Everything had to be clean. When you walk in this building, you look at the floors, you didn't see a speck on the floor shiny, you could eat off of the floor, it was so clean. The Inglers were pioneers in many ways. No child would be placed in a crib and left unattended. They needed to be in a family environment and she would hand feed them and uh, take care of them. And she had her own thoughts about how the place was to be cleaned and, and how each child was to be taken care of and fresh air. She would open up the windows every afternoon for a couple hours, no matter what the temperature was outdoors. And in the winter months, when we couldn't take them out, we would put their coats on, their gloves on, their scarves, open up all of the windows so we can let the fresh air in. That's how she done things. In 1953, Roy Engler enlisted another army of volunteers to add a second story to the building. They ran the children's home on a prayer and a shoestring without taking any money from the state. George Ed and Roy were opposed to receiving federal and state monies. Uh, they felt that this was a community home, that they were going to run it, and they were going to charge a reasonable rate, whatever it cost them to operate the home, and they did not want the governmental inf interference in how they should operate the home. He talked to people that could help him. He talked to people that could furnish money. He did what he had to do. He used to go to visit the various churches and fraternal organizations and would explain the purpose of Sunshine Children's Home and then solicit for funds. Roy also convinced some of the area's top business leaders to serve on Sunshine's first board of directors. The story of the Sunshine Home touched the hearts of everyone who heard it, and it wasn't long before they were reaching national audiences. Welcome to Welcome Travelers. Today, you'll meet a couple who have dedicated their lives to God's forgotten children. Meet Mr. and Mrs. Roy Engler, who live in Maumee, Ohio, a suburb of Toledo. They live in a small haven for mentally retarded children, which they manage on a 24-hour-a-day basis. Mrs. Angler, this work must be very difficult for you and your husband. No, we love this work. This is our life. We felt that we had to help somebody else. Letters and telegrams streamed in from all over the country. Some included donations, while others requested more information. The legend of the Sunshine Home even reached the fabled halls of Camelot. President Kennedy's sister, Mrs. Shriver, 
who had a mentally challenged sister who had been institutionalized. She came to visit Sunshine and was so taken up and overwhelmed with the love and the care that was exhibited at Sunshine that she spread the word nationally and that put Sunshine on the map. When Kennedy got in to the White House, and that brought everything to the forefront. At the time, it was a lot of people didn't want the public to know that they had retarded children. If you go back 100 years, 70 years, the feeling was that uh, all disabilities were inherited. So if you had a son or daughter with a developmental disability in general, the belief was, well, that came from either the father's side or the mother's side. And so that created some embarrassment for families. I think one of the big things that changed it was when the Kennedys had a child with disabilities and we had a president who had a sister who was developmentally disabled. And so families started to realize, hey, if the Kennedys can have a child with disabilities, anybody can. We had a big sign out in front that says Sunshine Children's Home. Visitors welcome. Uh, farmers coming back and forth from Archibald that happened to be connected with the Mennonite Church, per se, uh, would stop and visit Georgette. In 1955, uh, Raymond and Dora Knopfsinger uh, from Archibald stopped in here on a curious visit. And they saw the sign and stopped and went in to see what they're doing and asked if they need any help. And we all know we can make those offers and usually people never take us up on them. But the anglers, they had, they never let an offer like that go by the wayside. Uh, Roy would always put something near the front door that needed fixing. That day there was a pile of mending by the front door. And Dora took the mending and, and started working on it and she needed some help from her church friends. And, and they began a relationship with Roy Angler and Georgette and the children's home. Raymond and my dad, I think, sort of introduced him to the Mennonite uh, mental health program and to see what they might do. There was a, a lot of people in the Mennonite church that were interested in that type of thing. I think that grew out of World War II. Mennonite boys, most of them were conscientious objectors, and when they first were drafted, well, they had them doing make, make work but they finally put them in mental hospitals and they saw how terribly poor the people were treated and they were treated like animals. And the Mennonite Church took a real interest in improving the mental health programs in this country. By the end of the 1950s, caring for so many children 24 hours a day was taking a toll on the anglers and they needed a plan to ensure the future of the Sunshine Children's Home. The anglers were faced with something that all parents uh, with uh, a child with disabilities or children with disabilities are faced with, and that is, you know, who's going to keep an eye on my child after I'm no longer here? So for them, it was a much larger question than that because it wasn't just their children, it was the children of everybody that, that they were providing services to, the sons and daughters of lots of families. And so to them, it was important to find an organization that they felt shared their values. Five years later in 1960 then, Mr. and Mrs. Engler signed over the, the operations of the home to the Mennonite Church. The Angler's simple yet revolutionary vision thrived under the direction of the Mennonite Church. Sunshine began expanding services for residents of the children's home. Some began attending area schools and vocational training. Others started physical, occupational, and speech therapy programs. Over the years, it has grown into a multifaceted residential agency. Most of the residential options that are available in the state Sunshine is providing something in, in, in all of those options. Sunshine started with what we know today to be the children's home. It was kind of the first service that Sunshine provided. At one time in the history of Sunshine, someone had to be a child, had to be a minor to live in the children's home, and that's no longer the case. Someone, once they have moved in here, they're welcome to stay as long as they want to stay. It's long-term care. So the children's home is largely populated with people who are no longer children these days. 
we are able to serve individuals who are very medically concerning at one end of the spectrum, even individuals who are using ventilators. We're also able to provide services to people who are um, completely ambulatory and um, have very little medical need, but may have some behavioral types of challenges. And so uh, we have the ability to serve a broad array of individuals in the children's home and a, and a large variety of needs. In the 1990s, Sunshine added new amenities to the children's home, including a spiritual life center, gymnasium, and a heated therapy pool. We're able to uh, keep the water temperatures uh, higher than a normal pool is, as well as have the kind of features that allow folks with severe disabilities to get in and out of the water with ease. One of the nice things about the pool is that it actually has a hydraulic that brings the floor of the pool to the top. So it helps in a variety of ways. It becomes the cover, so it's incredibly safe. They could never fall into the pool even when it's covered because the floor becomes the cover. More consideration was given to the little pleasures of life that so many of us take for granted, like a walk through nature on a beautiful day. Volunteers from the Pi Kappa Phi fraternity came to Sunshine for a service project and built a raised boardwalk through the woods and meadows behind the children's home. The parents, when they come on the weekends or during the week to visit their children, and it's nice outside, they, they look for a place to go for a walk. And I can remember one parent even saying, for years I've had my child here in the children's home, and, and now, finally, there's some place to take her for a walk outside that is not a parking lot. By 1978, Sunshine was ready to take some of the residents who had grown up here as children and had learned how to live in an apartment or a house. And so they opened up their first group home in 1978. That was part of a national movement of, of providing service alternatives in the community, in typical homes, just like anyone else, to increase the community integration of individuals with disabilities. Sunshine now operates 15 family care or group homes in Lucas and Fulton County neighborhoods with a support staff to help the residents when needed. Uh, the individuals that live there sort of live as a family in that kind of a setting and take responsibility for things like doing the dishes and helping make dinner. All of the services that we provide is, is to teach them these sort of skills that we would all need in, in living in our own home. A lot of the residents that were babies when I came, they're in group home and they are working. Some live in their own apartment. It's, it's wonderful. Wonderful. And then we have a network of about 100, 150 people in supported living. They're renting their own apartments. Um, they're actually paying for their bills, but the support we provide are the staff that go and serve them and help them do their menu planning, their budgeting, their grocery shopping, all the daily living things that we all do. And over the years, we've developed family support services to help children with disabilities who are living at home. And so now we're serving 650, 700 families out in Northwest Ohio who have at least one child with disabilities living at home. Sunshine was one of the first agencies in the state that really got actively involved in providing services to families that had their sons and daughters still living at home. And one of the reasons was Sunshine had a waiting list of folks waiting to get services here. And so we started the respite program. Respite care provides a temporary break for families caring for loved ones with disabilities in their home. We basically have two locations at Sunshine where we provide respite care. We have a respite house on campus. Um, the services there tend to be a little less intense. In the children's home, we have a respite unit that we call Sunburst, and it's a four-bedroom unit. We can serve up to seven people in the Sunburst unit, and uh, we specialize more in providing services to individuals that need respite but also need on-site nursing services and may also have some behavioral support types of needs. One of the ways we define ourselves is by what we do. You're a doctor, a carpenter, an artist, so Sunshine opened a vocational center to offer job training and employment opportunities for its clients. 
We provide supported employment opportunities for people both here at Sunshine and in the community. We operate a greenhouse and so we have individuals growing plants and selling. We operate the laundry here at the children's home. Um, so we do the laundry for the people that live here seven days a week. They can uh, recycle, uh, doing shredding as well as recycling cans and plastic bottles. They can have a job producing art in our, our art classes so that they can sell those art pieces. Um, and now they're making uh, what we call super sacks, tote bags. So the material comes from industry, plastic woven material that would normally be discarded. Our folks are cutting it into the right size shapes, decorating them, and then sewing them up into two sizes of, of bags and selling those as well. Those jobs are all important and those jobs need to be done here, but then also for some people, that's a stepping stone to other employment in the community. In 2005, Sunshine went beyond merely training people for jobs and actually became an employer when they opened a fair trade coffee and gift shop in Maumee. Georgette's Grounds and Gifts was started as a community supported employment opportunity. We were not finding a lot of community employment opportunities for people. And so we decided to create our own. Between the actual cafe and gift shop, as well as the part of the business that packages coffee for retail sales in area stores and other coffee shops, employs about 25 uh, individuals. And we named it after Georgette Engler, who's one of our founders, kind of as an in honor to her, and also because her family, the Castlevons, owned a restaurant uh, in Maumee many, many years ago. So we kind of feel she and her family would uh, approve of what we're doing. People with pets know how much joy they can bring into life. They don't judge or discriminate, and they love unconditionally. We had, for quite a number of years, brought small animals in to visit. They put the animals in the lap of, of one of the, the kids sitting in a wheelchair, and, and you'd sit back and just be amazed and see how this person would just kind of wake up and get excited. Now we have a barn full of animals. We have goats, donkeys, llamas, and a pot -belly pig. And we have clients that actually work in the barn here at Sunshine on a daily basis during the week, and they come in and they feed the animals, clean the pens and clean the stalls and clean up the barn every day. I am a therapeutic horseback riding instructor, and I do lessons on horseback for adults and children with special needs. You ready to ride? Yeah? Therapeutic riding works every muscle in your body, even on sitting on the horse at a walk, and it improves your balance, self-confidence, self-esteem. I can take someone out of a wheelchair that has no use of their legs, put them on a horse and they can ride either independently or with um, sidewalkers. They love it. This is the most gratifying thing I could ever do. You get hugs, you get kisses, you get thank yous, and they just absolutely love it. They smile from ear to ear. Smiles and love are two of the most precious commodities on earth and both are found in great supply at Sunshine. I always had great admiration for our staff, and we had wonderful staff, and I don't think I could have done that kind of work, but I really, really admired the people that did. They've gotten these people that need help to do things that you'd think they never could do. You know, unfortunately, that was a population that was sort of shoved to the back. They're not, they're not treated that way. They love those people, and the people love them. As a community, we've come to realize it's important to have them as part of us, because it's much better for all of us to have a diverse community, and that we can learn as much from folks with disabilities as they can learn from us. We need them as a part of our community, we're lucky enough to have staff working here still to this day who have been here 30, 40, 50 years and folks who were with Mr. and Mrs. Ingler when, when, when they started the agency. And at that time, it wasn't common in facilities providing care to people with developmental disabilities to speak of you know, loving individuals. 
The care was provided, it was you know people's jobs, but Mrs. Ingler made it her point to instruct the staff to provide loving care to individuals. They had limited resources and they worked really hard to provide the care, but when everything was done, the next task was to take those children and rock them and talk gently to them and provide love. And I think that ability to talk freely about how important it is to provide love to individuals was, as odd as it sounds, innovation at that time. And I'm proud to be a part of that, that tradition of innovation.